Now, I'm sure a fair number of people listening to this show would have taken some, albeit very, very small part in the struggle against apartheid. There must be hundreds, if not thousands of people listening to this show who stood outside South Africa House in, in Trafalgar Square or put their name to petitions or went on marches and demonstrations. I mean, London in many senses was one of the absolute centres of the, the, the struggle of, against apartheid outside of South Africa. Um, and it was a very long struggle and it was one that I think at times people felt they would never win. And, and, and lots of people did their bit. I, I, I as a student at the LSE, you know, did my time on outside South Africa House and I went on a few demonstrations and I handed out a few leaflets, but that was as far as I went. But some people, and I didn't know anything about this until very recently, some people from here in London went a whole lot further, including two of the gentlemen sitting opposite me. They're Bob Newland and Stuart Round. And tonight up at Houseman's Bookshop on the Caledonian Road, they're, they're giving part of a talk called The ANC's London Recruits, The Secret War Against Apartheid. And they're both here with us now. Bob and Stuart, welcome to the show. Hi. Hi. Um, but first of all, before we went get on to what you actually ended up doing, how did you first get involved? Was it a similar process for both of you? Did you know each other back then? Or? No, and we were of different generations in many ways. I was involved in the anti-apartheid movement in the 60s. Uh, a friend of mine in the Young Communist League, who, uh, where I was a member, called me aside one evening and said, uh, got a special task for you to do. You've been selected. And we went for a walk, and uh, he told me that the ANC needed people who were white and could go into South Africa to help them and the story unfolds from there and what about you Stuart for me I, I started perhaps somewhat ironically with the peace movement I was an anti-nuclear activist um, growing up in the 1980s Maggie Thatcher was Prime Minister unemployment was rising we had the miners strike the Falklands war all of these things contributed to a general politicization and then of course you know the anti-apartheid movement was a major issue south africa was on the news all the time so i became increasingly aware of what so was did you going start on. off as many people did you know standing on picket lines and Absolutely. handing out leaflets yep. and, and yep. all of that sort in of stuff in the town center with a megaphone boycotting south african goods going on peace marches that that kind of thing absolutely just like anybody else but you like bob then went a stage further Yes. Um, I used to organise quite an active local youth CND group, which campaigned for nuclear disarmament, and we were quite effective, and I think, you know, I stood out in that regard. And the ANC was looking for young British people, um, you know, who weren't married, didn't have major commitments, who were free and committed, you know, who could go to South Africa and do certain things. So this is all sounding very sort of clandestine. Were there, was it, you know, meetings in back streets of pubs and with yeah, people absolutely. with kind of, you know, assumed names and all that sort of stuff? Stuff. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, one of the problems afterwards in tracking some people down is not knowing their real names. You know, afterwards when we've tried to hook up with people who we used to work with, um, obviously if you're going into South Africa, there's a chance you'll be arrested. If you're arrested, you'll be interrogated, perhaps tortured. Um, so and you were, you were both aware of this? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we had a detailed briefing as much as you could from afar on the consequence of being caught, on the nature of torture and the fact that nobody can resist it so one of the things we got was hang on for a short period of time give your mates a chance to get away allow us to be aware and we can react to that and protect the other people but give before you break because then you can control what you give and to a certain extent give information that you know they know they'll then take it as credible but you're not likely to give away too many secrets i mean this sounds this is already sounding extremely scary I mean, I was a young man, you know, with very similar views to your good selves on, on South Africa and probably many other issues. But I don't think I'd have been able to, to, to even countenance that. Well, it, it's certainly scary. It's <laughs> exciting. And to be fair, it was also very good fun. I mean, particularly yeah. what, what I was doing. But I mean, the thing with a fascist state, I mean, fascism is a term that's banded around, but South Africa was a fascist state in the pure meaning of and the word. And certainly a racist state. Yeah, absolutely. That was that was part of it. And, you know, if you're going to stand up to that and overthrow it, then you have to be prepared to take the risks involved. Let's look at what you both actually did. Um, we'll start with you. Um, Bob, yep. and yours in, yours involved explosive devices, but not bombs. No, we called them leaflet bombs, but they were uh, using gunpowder from like a firework, it, it compacted into a tube, and that propelled a platform of wood into the sky, which had leaflets circled on it, so that when it went up 60 foot in the air, they were distributed over a wide area. So we focused on 
uh, main line railway stations, bus stations. Gar- uh, when you say we, I mean, obviously there are other okay. people and they will remain, you know, nameless if they decide to do so. Was there, were, were, was there a cell, if you like? Or? No, we, were, we went out in pairs, generally, uh, for two or three days for this exercise. So we'd go to Johannesburg, Durban, four or five cities um, from 69 through till 71. Right. Um, and they tended to be simultaneous events in different cities around and they were planned and organised in that way. And so you were leaf- leaflet bombing, yeah. if you like? Yeah. Sending so out we, leaflets. Because of the nature of apartheid and the fact that most of the black and uh, Indian population lived outside the cities but served them. So every morning thousands and thousands of black and uh, Indian workers came into the cities and every night they went out. So there was a clear point of focus at the stations where it was possible to access them. And the leaflets were saying the ANC lives... Cummins volunteer join the armed struggle um, and things like that. How did you get to test these these devices? They were tested on Hampstead Heath. Seriously? Uh, yeah. Uh, but we didn't test them. They were tested by the specialists that developed them. I was going to say... guys they... who'd been involved in the Second World War and knew about these. Things. Oh, really? So when you talk about those guys, are these South African South guys? South Africans, yeah. After the Rivonia trial, when the top leadership of the ANC was imprisoned for life with Nelson Mandela and the others, um, the key players in the underground uh, movement, because they were all banned, their yep. organisations, the ANC, the Communist Party, the trade unions, every kind of popular organisation was banned. They moved out of South Africa to organise resistance they were all from in outside. Ex- and the London was a hub for that. So there were some key people, including Joe Slovo yep. and Ronnie Casrals, who was the guy who organised this particular campaign of propaganda. And it was because the ANC had been so damaged by this massive... Uh, repression that was taking place and the rest of the leadership they needed to keep their name alive whilst the underground organization was rebuilt so i played a role in that but i subsequently played a role as the armed struggle and the underground organization was being rebuilt to meet a ship coming down from somalia bringing 20 25 uh, anc fighters down into land at durban so you're actually taking armed men that was the aim although the boat broke down several times and never actually made it so we went out for three weeks planned for this exercise although there'd been a lot of preparation for it and we're actually there for eight weeks when we had to flee with a message that said mother's dead the project was the mother project and we had mothers unwell mothers dying and then mothers died and that said get the hell out of there which we did Stuart, you're you actually actively took arms into south africa that's right yes um I mean, the... did you have guns stuffed down your trousers not quite. <laughs> they, were, they were rather well concealed. The ANC set up a safari company in London as a front which took genuine, innocent, unsuspecting tourists on a seven-week safari from Nairobi in Kenya all the way down to Cape Town in South Africa. And within the vehicle were built secret compartments which along the way, as we pass through Lusaka, in fact, would be loaded with caches of weapons. Um, so then, you're a pacifist who's carrying arms? Well, I began as a pacifist, yes. Um, but, I mean, the thing with the situation in South Africa that made, I believe anyway, the arms struggle justified was that every avenue of democratic protest that normally we would rely on, um, the ability to vote fundamentally, to write an outrage letter to your MP, to sit on a radio show like this and give your opinion... All of those avenues were closed off, not just closed off in in uh, an easy way. They were closed off with violence and repression and people were being shot on the street when they demonstrated. So it really left no alternative for the ANC but to take up arms. I mean, clearly what you're doing was illegal in, and very dangerous to Absolutely. do in South Africa. Yeah. Illegal here as well, I assume. Mm-hmm. Or not? Um, I, I wouldn't imagine we committed any crimes in, in this country. Um, but, but do you think you were being watched in this country? There were a lot of South African intelligence agents in London looking for precisely this this kind of really? activity. What, they yeah. sort of knew it was going on? I think, yes, yes. They must have known or at least suspected that it was possible. So one of the things that, that we were restricted from doing was taking part in any activity in this so country. So you couldn't be standing on picket lines no, and not going on absolutely. marches? Absolutely. And... One, one photograph could have compromised the whole operation or name appearing in the newspaper or anything like that. So we had to live very... Uh, undercover lives um, with our How tough lives. is that? Uh, particularly when you're young men and, and you like to have a pint and you like to tell your mates what you're doing and, and also you feel probably quite proud of what you're doing I guess. Yeah. Well Stuart of course was involved in a slightly different stage and a much more uh, immediately dangerous operation. I was still involved in political activity during that time but kept right away from anti-apartheid areas of activity so that the immediate because that was where the monitoring took place but there was a funny thing when I went to meet the ship coming down to Durban from Somalia I went with a guy called Alex Mumbaris who subsequently went back to come across land uh, bringing the people who were supposed to come on the ship 
and got arrested because someone had been caught and found, as did Sean Hosey, who took some leaflets, uh, some documents out for one of the um, underground fighters. And uh, when Alex was on trial, in his trial papers, to prove under the offences under the Suppression of Communism Act, they produced a book, a Stalin volume, which was mine. I'd lent him, and they'd broken into his flat in London either boss or our security services, and taken that as part of the trial papers to prove that he was a dangerous communist. So there were certainly things happening here, and they tried to blow up... Well, they did actually blow up the ANC office mm. in London, yeah, in Penton Street. Street. I mean, the thing did is... You feel sc- did, were there any moments when you felt, oh, look, this is all going to unravel? Um, yes, yeah. I mean, there were a few. Um, particularly the border crossing was the tricky part, the most worrying part, and then also when the boxes were removed from the truck and in the van. But, I mean, a couple of times going through the border, they would bring a sniffer dog on and the dog would sit down and the border guard would say to you, uh, are you sure you don't have any weapons on board? And you'd be, well, yeah, I mean, but soldiers are on on and off here all the time with weapons. so And they just believe you rather than the dog and off you'll go. Because they didn't, the whole point of, you know, what we were doing was to use their racism against them. They didn't expect white people to be smuggling weapons and they certainly didn't expect British white people to be smuggling weapons. Um, they were colourblind. It was a powerful weapon that we were able to use against them. Yeah. The, uh, when Nelson Mandela gets freed and finally apartheid crumbles, how did you, did you, what did you feel? Oh, yeah, wonderful. Um, it was good to see. I mean, I, I felt some caution as well, because I think a lot of people were very over-optimistic yeah. with their expectations of what would happen in South Africa, and I didn't quite share that unbridled optimism. But no, I mean, it was wonderful to see. I mean, of all the struggles that happened through that period of time, it was one that we won. So it was hugely satisfying. And Have great. you been back since? Yeah, I just got back now, um, just over a week ago. I spent the first six months of this year in South Africa. And I went back in June f- to visit uh, this year and last year, but had never been before that. And was there any official recognition of what you and other comrades, I guess, as you would have seen them, had, have done? Sure, yeah. We actually did an event at uh, Lily's Leaf, where the Deputy Minister of Defence was there. Um, we've met with the Deputy President as well. Uh, Lily's Leaf is the place where the Rivonia trialists were arrested. Uh, it's actually the 50th anniversary of those arrests this year. And that's where the truck, uh, the safari truck that I used to drive, is now parked as a museum exhibit. So if anyone wants to see it, then they can go there. <laughs> Yeah, we had amazing meetings, but also with lots of people, just the ordinary people of South Africa, conversations on the streets. We were there for Youth Day, which commemorates the youth uprising in 1976, where nearly 600 young people were killed, school students protesting against the use of Afrikaners, Afrikaans as their language at school. And young people were coming up to us and saying, what are you doing here? Because uh, we were clearly strangers. Yeah. And uh, then talking to us and saying, well, that's fantastic. We knew nothing about this. Of course, because it was kept completely secret. We didn't discuss it. It wasn't spoken amongst our colleagues any idea how many british people were involved mm, there were some uh, we call them london recruits because they were recruited in london but it included irish americans canadian uh, Aust- uh, australians dutch people and so on as well but based from london primarily um 60 70 over a period yeah. of time but many of them just made one visit that sure. was it um, others played did greater roles and were underground for for years and more are surfacing all the time. I mean, we know of about 60 people who, in one way or another, were involved. It's a fascinating story. It was an extraordinary experience and a wonderful, wonderful opportunity to do something a bit special. Something which some people, though, would say was akin to terrorism. Sure. Um, I mean, armed struggle is not something that you take lightly. I mean, as I said, it was the only course of action open to the ANC, and it did play a role in bringing apartheid to an end, particularly in the later years. It saved lives as well, because um, a lot of the ANC-supporting townships were under attack from what they called the third force, where the police would assist and certainly stand idly by while UNITA guerrillas were brought into townships who would run on the rampage massacring people so the weapons we supplied help people to defend themselves from that. You're going to be telling these stories tonight aren't you? Yes. What's the tell us about a bit about the event. Okay well we wrote a chapter of a book each of us 32 of us which is called the London Recruits. Right. The, the so there is a secret, book? There is a book. The Secret Fight Against Apartheid and uh it tells each individual story and that book is published and 
around that book have been a number of meetings and discussions in bookshops. There was a meeting in Liverpool uh, organised by the council and we've had meetings all over the place where we sit and talk about our experiences, the books on sale, uh, and so bookshops are our ideal venue for that. The visit to South Africa last year was the book launch in South Africa and the venue for that as well. So that's what's there tonight, the book, a conversation. Hausman's organised a series of lectures and discussions around books and publications of interest and, uh, and this is one of them and yours is tonight down at yeah. houseman's bookshop on the caledonian road at yeah. seven people so, can just turn up yep yeah. there's a small admission fee but it's refundable against it's three pounds but it's refundable against any book purchase did any of the british or international um volunteers get caught yeah sean hosey who came from coventry originally from an irish uh, working class family um was taking a in 1972 there 73 yeah. was taking uh, some passes in for an underground fighter and he'd been exposed and the guy he met to hand over the documents was a policeman and he was arrested and got five years in prison alex mumbaris who went with me to do the he'd originally been a, a, a leaflet bomber but then he did this ship in from somalia and then went across land with with fighters he was captured along with his wife he got 12 years but actually escaped from pretoria central prison after seven with two other guys tim jenkin and uh Stephen. Fascinating stories. Yeah, absolutely amazing guy. And the book is called The ANC's London Recruits, The Secret War Against Apartheid. And the event this evening is up at Houseman's Bookshop on the Caledonian Road at 7pm. And you've been hearing from Bob Newland and Stuart Round. Gentlemen, thank you both very, very much. Thank, thank you for you. having us.